Today we're going to be refuting the best argument against God's existence. And who believes that this is the best argument that atheists have? Well, a lot of Christians, as well as a lot of atheists, of course. And to prove my point, let's watch this quick clip. I think that the most compelling argument against God's existence would be what philosophers call the hiddenness of God. Namely, it would be easy for God to make his existence so much more obvious. Uh, he could have written his name in the stars or put a neon cross in the sign uh, saying, I love you, and we would all know that he exists. Uh, but he hasn't done so. God remains uh, at arm's distance from us. And many times in life's most difficult times, we don't perceive God's existence clearly. And so the hiddenness of God is a challenge. So that's just one example of the many famous philosophers of our day that claim that this is the best uh, atheist argument against God's existence. But today I'm going to be responding to this video with over a million views. Uh, this is why I don't believe in God. I want to uh, make my own case that upon uh, an honest analysis of the world we find ourselves in, it should compel us to dismiss the hypothesis of a supernatural creator. Right off the bat, we already know he's wrong because in Genesis chapter 1, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. There is no hypothesis. There's no theorizing about God's existence. We all know it because God told us that he created the heavens and the earth. He's going to use that type of language throughout the video as if we are neutral creatures and we aren't actively rebelling against God and as if God hasn't already made his existence evident to every one of us through nature nature and in our own hearts. I will not be asking you to look in ancient scripture, nor to the beginning of the universe, nor indeed down a microscope, instead just to your uh, direct experience of the world and facts about the lives of people within it. I will, however, indulge in a brief biblical recital um, because I want to begin with a book, uh, with a reading from the book of Psalms. Side notes, the Bible, the word of God that convicts your heart is a part of your direct experience with the world. So if you could all turn to Psalm 139, unless, of course, you've already committed this famous passage to memory. Verse 7 onwards reads, where can I go from your presence? Or where can I flee from your spirit? If I ascend to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of the Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall guide me and your right hand shall hold me fast. This poem in its entirety is given by the NRSV, a title, The Inescapable God. But my first argument, and it's going to be the first of three, uh, against the viability of deism flows from the demonstrable fact that this divine consolation is seemingly not offered universally. Quickly, I just want to add, yes, this is 100% true. This is not for everyone. Even there, your hand will lead me and your right hand will lay hold of me. This is only talking about believers. This is not talking about non-believers. How precious are your thoughts to me, O oh God? Clearly, the person in writing this believes in God and loves God. If I should count God's thoughts, they would outnumber the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. And of course, he continues, oh, that you would slay the wicked. Oh, men of bloodshed, depart from me. There's two groups of people described in the Bible, the righteous and the unrighteous. And God is with the righteous and he is against the wicked. You have to understand this when you're reading the Bible because these scriptures about God loving us, those apply to the righteous, not the unrighteous. Because there's not a single one of you who could possibly argue that destroying someone's soul and their body in hell is an act of love. That is an act of hatred, God's wrath being poured out on sinners. We hear all the time that God loves everyone. In one sense, this is true. He, he gives the rain to the unjust and the just. He gives life to every single human being on earth right now, but clearly he does not give eternal life to everyone. That special forgiving and merciful love is only for the elect. Apart from being unable to escape God, there is a very real contingent of non-believers, and I would count myself among their number, who are unable by any means to discover him, who seek and do not find, who knock and receive, as it were, no answer. Then they will call on me, but I will not answer. They will seek me earnestly, but they will not find me. Doesn't that sound odd? Maybe it's because I took it out of context, like you could easily take out of context the verses that say, seek and you will find, knock and it will be open to you. Now, of course, this comes from Proverbs chapter one, where wisdom is speaking. And she says, you neglected all my counsel and were not willing to accept my reproof. I will also laugh at your disaster. I will mock when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your disaster comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, then they will call on me, but I will not answer. Then they will seek me earnestly, but they will not find me because they hated knowledge and did not choose the fear of Yahweh, the Lord. And if you look earlier in chapter one, it says the fear of Yahweh is the beginning of knowledge. Ignorant fools despise wisdom and discipline. So how are you going to find God if you don't fear God? 
you're not going to. Those scriptures about if you seek me, you will find me are not talking about the people who don't fear God. They're talking about the people who love God, who believe in him already. Matthew chapter 7, for example, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and it will be opened to you. Who is he talking to? He's not talking to atheists who are just trying to find out reasons to believe in God. He's talking to believers. Verse 11, how much more will your father your father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him this only works if you believe that god exists in the first place real quick let's just go to romans chapter one because this is what we have to understand when we're talking to non-believers and about non-believers this is what they're doing for the wrath of god is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because that which is known about god is evident within them for god made it evident to them. The atheist problem is not that they don't have enough evidence. It's that they're evil. Oh, but aren't you Christians evil as well? Don't we sin? Oh, yes, we do. But here's the difference. I am also righteous. Christ lives in me. The Holy Spirit dwells in me. So I'm a sinner who's righteous by faith in God. But the thing is with the atheists who don't believe in God, they are unrighteous. They are evil with no hint of righteousness at all in them. Once again, John chapter seven, the world hates me because uh, I haven't given it enough evidence so they don't believe in me, blah, blah, blah. No, he bears witness about it that its deeds are evil. Always remember that guys, the only reason people don't believe in Jesus is because they are evil and they don't want to submit to God. It's a heart problem, not an evidence problem. Once you understand that, you'll be able to answer every atheist objection to Christianity because you'll be able to recognize that there mind isn't thinking properly they're thinking in a sinful way so as believers we have two options we can believe romans chapter one where it says that which is known about god is evident within them for god made it evident to them and they're suppressing that truth and unrighteousness or we can believe the liars the atheists of the world who are saying that they're genuinely seeking God but can't find him. There's truly no in between. It's either this verse is true or there are people genuinely seeking God with a good heart. They're just good people, right? They're seeking God, but God just won't save them. He's hiding himself from those people. This strange phenomenon is known as the problem of divine hiddenness. If there is a God, then simply, why is he hidden from so many of us so much of the time? If theism is to offer a sufficient account of reality, then it must offer an account of what J.L. Schellenberg has famously labeled non-resistant non-belief, which he distinguishes from resistant non-belief. It's sometimes said by a theist who wishes to explain uh, the problem of divine hiddenness that people simply disbelieve through their own fault. They're too stubborn. They're purposefully blinding themselves to the evidence because they don't want it to be true. They're not approaching the arguments on, uh, honestly with an open heart. The reason why Christians say that is because uh, that's what the Bible says. If they would only do this, then God would surely reveal himself. Now, that's uh, not what I would say. <laughs> if, if you do X thing, then God will do this for you, reveal himself to you and save you, take the blinders off you and give you a new heart of flesh. That would... That would be workspace salvation, so can't have that. For what it's worth, I do think that such people exist. I think many such people exist. Uh, there are people who come to this debate with their minds already made up. There are people who want it not to be true, that God exists, and in fact wouldn't submit to that truth even if it were true. There are, however, also people who disbelieve in God, not out of resistance or stubbornness or a hardened heart, but rather due to sheer lack of conviction. Indeed, many such people actively want to be convinced of God's existence and would jump at the chance of entering into a relationship with him. So, you must be born again. That's how your relationship with God begins. Uh, John chapter 3 says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one jumps into a relationship with God, he cannot see the kingdom. Wait, no. Uh, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. How does this make any sense? What? what? What does he mean? How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which has been born of the flesh is flesh, and that which has been born of the spirit is spirit. This is one of the most basic teachings of Christianity. It's not that you jump into a relationship with your mother when you're born. It's that your mother forced you into that relationship. She gave birth to you. It's a gift of life. And it's the exact same thing with the salvation. Uh, God forced you into that. And it's a marvelous thing when God changes your heart, gives you a heart of flesh, causes you to have faith in him and repent because those are all gifts in the Bible. That's what grace is by definition. It's not you who chooses it. It's not you who jumped into relationship with God. It's Luke chapter 15. When Jesus, the good shepherd, has a hundred sheep and has lost one of them, what does he do? Does he sit there hoping for that sheep to just jump back to relationship with him? Or what does he do? What does a good shepherd do? He leaves the 99 in the open pasture and goes after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he's found it, he hopes, he just hopes to God that the sheep 
accepts his offer of salvation. Nope, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing because Jesus owns the sheep. He owns his people. God owns his people. So what happens when a sinner repents and turns to Christ? What actually happens there? It's not that that person just became a good person all of a sudden and decided, hey, I don't want to sin anymore. It's that God changed his heart. That's what salvation is. And every atheist can't understand this because first of all, they don't fear God. So they can't understand spiritual things. And number two, also a lot of Christians at least in the United States, don't teach this divine truth anymore and instead teach a bunch of free will stuff, which doesn't appear in the Bible. But moving on. But no matter how hard they search, they simply find no answer forthcoming from the heavens. And this is the non-resistant non-believer. Formally, then, Schellenberg's problem of divine hiddenness can be stated as follows. Premise one, if there is a God, he is perfectly loving, something I'm pretty sure Jonathan agrees Usually with. Usually it's stated as all loving, which is not true, but perfectly loving, you could get away with that. Yes, God is perfectly loving. To who? <laughs> Again, you have to specify who is he loving. He loves his son perfectly. Yes, he loves the Holy Spirit. And he also loves his elect, his chosen people from the foundation of the world. But the Bible clearly describes non-believers as objects of wrath, children of wrath, children of the devil, objects of God's hatred. In fact, 2 Peter chapter 2 is talking about false teachers. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, blaspheming where they have no knowledge. They are stains and blemishes, reviling in their deceptions as they feast with you, having eyes full of adultery and unceasing sin, enticing unstable souls, having a heart trained in greed. They are accursed children. And real quick, yes, I know the Bible does say the one who does not love does not know God because... God is love. Yes, God is love. I love this fact. By this, the love of God was manifested in us that God sent his only begotten son into the world so that we, we, who's we? We, the believers, we might live through him. The love of God is for those who believe. The full love of God, that is. We already mentioned. Yes, I know. God is kind and patient with the wicked. But no, he does not forgive and have mercy on the wicked. As Jesus said, blessed are the merciful for they shall receive mercy. The merciless are not going to receive mercy. And that's a good thing. Remember, God is a good judge. Every sin of non-believers are still getting tracked. There is no sin in the history of all mankind that is not going to be paid for. For us righteous people, they were paid for at the cross by Jesus. And as for the non-believers, they're going to have to pay for their sins themselves with death on judgment day. Premise two, if a perfectly loving God exists, non-resistant non-belief does not occur. Premise three, non-resistant non-belief does occur. Four, therefore, no perfectly loving God exists. And the conclusion from the first premise is that therefore there is no God. A loving God, like the Christian God, would surely not refuse any willing person from developing a relationship with him. And so if somebody is truly non-resistant and open to receiving God's grace, we should expect them to receive it. Once again, you have to recognize workspace salvation when you say it. If X person does this, if X person is open to receiving God's grace, God should save that person. He should give his grace to that person. He's obligated to give his grace to that person. Just imagine committing a crime and then showing up in court saying, Your Honor, I'm willing to receive forgiveness what does that what does that mean what does that do a fair judge is going to say uh no uh, just no <laughs> biblically what needs to happen for someone to be saved is the judge has to have mercy on that person and romans 9 18 says he has mercy on whom he desires and he hardens whom he desires so no god is never <laughs> obligated to show mercy to anyone if he desires to have mercy on this person and not the other if anything was unfair it's the person who received mercy rather than justice because everyone deserves justice the fact is nobody is deserving of god's love so yeah, that's the first thing that needs to happen for someone to receive mercy. God has to want to give mercy to this person. And number two, since that would be unjust if this person's sin just went unpunished, the good judge will also send a propitiation for this person's sins. That's, of course, Jesus. The son dies for this person's sins. But wait, <laughs> it's not over. There's still more work that needs to be done. What if this sinner just receives mercy and, you know, his sins are paid for, but what about him going on sin? Sinning. What's the solution to that? Oh, his Holy Spirit. So the Father has mercy on this person. He sends his Son to die for that person, and he also sends his Holy Spirit to that person. And what does the Holy Spirit do? do according to titus chapter 3 verse 5 he saved us not by works which we did in righteousness but according to 
his mercy. Once again, it's not according to your jumping into a relationship with him. It's according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The renewal. Yes, this person, not a sinner anymore. He's going to become sanctified, more holy throughout his life. And upon resurrection, which is at Christ's second coming, he becomes perfectly sanctified and he never sins ever again. Therefore, the sin problem is solved. And who was it solved by? It wasn't solved by us sinners changing our own hearts and becoming perfect at the resurrection. It was by God's love, through his Son, by his Holy Spirit. The question then, is there such a thing as non-resistant non-belief, a non-resistant non-believer? The answer, biblically speaking, is absolutely not. Which, all I can really say is nice to meet you. And to which every biblical Christian should say, I don't believe you. I believe God's word instead. And by the way, if you ever get into this type of conversation with a non-believer who uses this argument, you are going to have to convey that truth to them in the kindest way possible somehow. It's going to be offensive. Of course, the gospel itself is offensive. But re remember, Timothy chapter 2, the Lord's slave must not be quarrelsome. Once again, don't get into this just heated argument with anybody, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient when wronged, whoops, with gentleness, correcting those who are in opposition. If perhaps they may turn themselves uh, and receive the full knowledge. Wait, no. <laughs> Once again, uh, our hope is that God gives them repentance, leading to the full knowledge of the truth. Once again, guys, you're not going to have the full knowledge of the truth unless repentance comes first, which comes from God. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, having been held captive by him to do his will. So yes, this is the non-believer you're speaking to, held captive by the devil to do his will. And we are hoping that God gives them repentance so that they may come to their senses. You're not talking to a reasonable person when you're talking to non-believers. Always remember that. This is why speaking God's word is so important to non-believers. Speaking his truth to them is of utmost importance because it's not evidence after evidence after evidence that leads them to Christ. They already have all the evidence. God made himself evident to them already. As Jesus said in John chapter six, the words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. The only way non-believers is going to repent is if you give them God's word. Whatever you do when you're speaking to non-believers, just do not try to get them to believe in the Bible using your own persuasive analogies and philosophy and evidence arguments. Your job is to correct them gently in hopes that God gives them repentance and God makes them born again so that they can understand the spiritual things. The last time I debated Jonathan a number of years ago, when I was just a few months out of being a teenager, I said that even if I thought, even if I found Christianity to be true, I still wouldn't want to worship the God uh, that it promotes. I now, since then, have realized how irrational and self-defeating this assertion is. I stand before you today as an example of a non-resistant non-believer. I think it would be great if God existed. I really do. I would, I would absolutely love to escape death. I, would I want you to notice how the benefits of God's existence are about him, not about God. Oh, I would love to escape death, blah, blah, blah. Let, let's see what else he says. Elish, being a recipient of unconditional love. Less self Once again, it's about me. I would love to be the recipient of unconditional love. How about believe in God because it's the right thing to do? How about honor him, give him glory because it's the right thing to do? How about believing in God because you want to give someone thanks for the fact that you're alive and you can eat food, have friends, and just have a good time? Not to ignore all the bad things that happen in life, but just the fact that you exist is something to give him thanks for. And it's the right thing to give him thanks for that. Just notice the man-centeredness in what he's saying right here. He still thinks it's about him. The biblical God is not about man. This is how we know he's not actually seeking the biblical God of scripture. Therefore, he's not actually seeking God. He's not a non-resistant non-believer. I would love to be able to worship that which deserves to be worshipped. I just don't think it's true. As, as a Catholic child, I was once an, an altar boy. I would serve the altar of Mother Church every Sunday dressed in a white robe. In the time since then, I have, to put it mildly, been looking for God. I went to Catholic schools. I studied philosophy and theology at A-levels. I made a career out of engaging with religious arguments. I have explored arguments from contingency, from fine-tuning, from motion, from mathematics, from, indeed, from uh, irreducible complexity and the alleged resurrection of Jesus. Of so, you hear all those examples of seeking for God? Reading the Bible isn't one of them that he mentioned. Going to Catholic school and studying theology at a most likely liberal university doesn't count as seeking God. I think the only way of seeking God is looking for for him in his word, seeing what he says so you can understand him. Because reading books about arguments for God's existence from philosophers is not God's word. That's not seeking God. So yeah, seeking God involves looking for his guidance 
from his word that he gave to us. And number two, praying a lot for wisdom, asking him for forgiveness and asking him for more revelation. Yes, it is biblical to ask for more conviction, more faith. But the thing is, you can't ask God for more revelation and seek him if you don't even believe he exists. You have to believe that he exists first. And you see the problem with being an atheist is that you don't even ask because you don't believe he exists. Therefore, you actually can't seek God. You can't seek someone who you don't believe exists. It may surprise my followers online to learn uh, that at university I visited numerous churches on the invitation of various friends. I spent hours talking with religious friends. I attended Bible groups regularly too, which might surprise people uh, as well. And in fact, I, I still do attend such groups. Just recently, I agreed to embark on a series of study of the wisdom literature, specifically reading it again in the hopes that this time I might finally feel a divine presence seeping from between the lines. I have looked, in other words, in a great deal of places. I read Athanasius and Anselm. I read Augustine and Aquinas. I, I looked in Julian of Norwich and Catherine of... So he's read all these Christian philosophers. I don't doubt that he's read so much more than I have on Augustine or Aquinas. But again, reading Aquinas or Augustine is not seeking God. In fact, come to think of it, he never even defined what seeking God even is. I guess he's doing that right now, but again, just biblically speaking, his definition is wrong. You don't seek God by seeking Christians. You seek the leader of the Christians. Sienna, I looked at the sociological origin of religious belief in Durkheim and Marx and Freud and Young. Marx? I Did he just say Marx? Hold on. I've looked in the modern works of people like Ed Faser and Bill Craig and Michael Murray and Richard Swinburne and Alvin Plantinga. I've looked in poetry. I've looked in the Psalms. I've looked in Job. I've looked in Ecclesiastes. I've looked in Dostoevsky. I read C.S. Lewis. I listened to worship music. See, he just grouped in some biblical books along with all of these non-biblical books as if they're on the same level of seeking God, which of course they're not. Am I saying that you can't get any sort of divine revelation from these non-biblical books? No, of course not. God can work through those as well. But if you want to seek God, you seek him in his His word that is infallible, not in C.S. Lewis or Bill Craig. I prayed. I studied the gospel. I even got an actual degree in theology from a university and nothing, nothing, not once, not nearly, not ever, not even briefly have I experienced anything that speaks to the existence of a God. Once again, we have two choices as Christians. Do we believe him or do we believe that he is suppressing the truth in unrighteousness? And that which is known about God is evident within them already, within him. For God made it evident to him. I think like I have gone above and beyond what can be reasonably expected of any atheist who wishes to entertain the God hypothesis. And for my efforts, I have been awarded radio Silent. The inescapable God of the NRSV, in other words, is for me the invisible God or the inapproachable God. Um, did he knowingly quote First Timothy six sixteen? Jesus alone has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal might. Amen. Imagine trying to reach on your of your own power someone who is unapproachable and you can't see. Exactly. This is a good time to talk about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, where it says, In the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God. God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's part of God's plan that this man, along with many other people, the world at large, did not come to know God by trying to reason to God and trying to look for evidence for his existence. God was actually well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Isn't that awesome? People are only ever going to be saved by the preaching of the word of God, the good news, not by clever philosophical arguments about, oh, your eye is so complex, therefore it had to have a designer behind it, therefore God exists, therefore you should repent. Once again, I'm not saying that those arguments are just evil arguments and they're of the devil and you can't ever use them. But the problem with the people who typically use those arguments do not lean on God's word. They lean more on philosophy, with, with man's wisdom. I mean, seriously, why doesn't the Bible try to give us arguments for God's existence? I mean, seriously, if God wanted us to use arguments to prove that he exists, then he would have told us which are the best arguments to use against atheists, but he didn't do that. So there's a better way to do apologetics. My question to Jonathan then is simple. How can theism account for this lived experience? How can it account, in other words, for non-resistant, non Beliefs. Yeah, that's pretty much it about divine hiddenness. It all stems from the idea that there are people who genuinely, from a good heart, seek God, but God's not revealing himself to them. Therefore, God is either evil or does not exist. And the biblical answer is Romans chapter 3. Just as it is written, Jews and Greeks are all under sin. There is none righteous, not even one. There's none who understands. There is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There's 
none who does good, not even one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now the good news is that there are people who fear God and are worthy and seek God and do good. How is this possible, you might ask? God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. That's good news, isn't it? So the people who become the righteousness of God in Christ through faith, they seek God, they do good, and of course, they are worthy. Not in and of themselves, but because of Christ who lives in them. Anyways, that's going to be it for today. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe and like the video so that this video can be pushed out to more people so that more Christians will be able to answer the divine hiddenness argument. Love you guys so much.